Mike's got something, all right. He's got America. But there are guys who stay up nights figuring out how to take that away from him. I happen to know the facts. Now, friends, I'm just an average American. But I'm an American-American. And some of the things I see in this country of ours make my blood boil. I see Negroes holding jobs that belong to me and you. Now I ask you, if we allow this thing to go on, what's going to become of us real Americans? I've heard this kind of talk before, but I never expected to hear it in America. This fellow seems to know what he's talking about. Huh? What are we real Americans going to do about it? You'll find it right here in this little pamphlet. The truth about Negroes and foreigners. The truth about the Catholic Church. Do you believe in that kind of talk? I don't know. It makes pretty good sense to me. And I tell you, friends, we'll never be able to call this country our own until it's a country without. Without what? Yeah, without what? Without Negroes. Without alien foreigners. Without Catholics. Without Freemasons. You know these What's wrong with the Masons? I'm a Mason. Hey, that fellow's talking about me. And that makes a difference, doesn't it? These are your enemies. These are the people who are trying to take over our country. Now you know them. You know what they stand for. And it's up to you and me to fight them. Fight them and destroy them before they destroy us. Thank you. Before he said Masons, you were ready to agree with him. Well, yes, but he was talking about... What about those other people? But in this country, we have no other people. We are American people. What about you? You aren't American, are you? I was born in Hungary, but now I am an American citizen. And I have seen what this kind of talk can do. I saw it in Berlin. What were you doing there? I was a professor at the university. I heard the same words we have heard today. But I was a fool then. I thought Nazis were crazy people, stupid fanatics. But unfortunately, it was not so. You see, they knew that they were not strong enough to conquer a unified country. So they split Germany into small groups. They used prejudice as a practical weapon to cripple the nation. Of course, that was not easy to do. They had to work hard to do it. You see, we human beings are not born with prejudices. Always they are made for us. Made by someone who wants something. Remember that when you hear this kind of talk. Somebody is going to get something out of it. And it isn't going to be you. This is not classroom theory. I saw it happen. I saw it first in Berlin in 1932. Five young men that I knew were standing in the crowd listening to the Nazi speaker. Eric was a Catholic. Anton, a student of mine, was a Jew. Heinrich owned a small hardware store. Karl was a farmer. And Hans was an unemployed metal worker. To all Bavarian Germans, I say it is time you inherited the nation which rightfully belongs to you. To you alone belongs the glorious destiny of the greater Germany. The Nazi party will provide land for the farmer, work for the worker, and profits for the small businessman. Who is getting these things now? The Jew. The Jew who has stolen our nation and our birthright. Who makes all the money and takes all our jobs? The Jew! He must be shunned. He must be ostracized. He must be eliminated. And the Catholics, we don't want our great nation run by a foreign church. We Germans will know what to do with these people when the time comes. They and their faith must be destroyed. Then there are the Freemasons. In Germany, we have no place for secret societies. There may be only one society, and that is the Nazi party. There may be no secrecy about that in the new greater Germany. One by one, he attacked each minority and he split them off one from the other. These men were all fellow Germans when they came here today. Now they were split into rival groups, suspicious of each other, hating each other. They were being swindled, all of them. 
But the man who was really being fooled was Hans. He was pure German, according to Nazi standards. To him, they promised everything, and he fell for it. That's how Hans became a superman. They gave him a uniform, and they pumped up his ego. He wasn't just a little fellow out of work anymore. He was a member of the master race. Hans and thousands of others like him, all playing a sucker's game. They gambled with other people's liberty, a nation of suckers. Hitler needed these people. There was lots of work to be done. There were trade unions to be smashed, because unions were organized and might offer resistance. There were many political parties in Germany. These the Nazis destroyed. They were determined to smash every organization where people might band together and resist them. There were Jews to be beaten and killed. The Jews were not powerful, but they were a convenient excuse for all the nation's ills. And besides, a Nazi party member could not take over this man's store. Hundreds of Catholics were put in jail because the Catholic Church had strength and could resist the Nazi drive for power. They had split the nation into a hundred pieces. And then one by one, they had destroyed the pieces. Over these broken pieces, the Nazis rode into power. One party, one nation, one religion. These men had won their struggle for power. They now ruled all of Germany. But still they had trouble with their oldest and most persistent enemy, the truth. They found that truth does not die easily. And so they decided to abolish truth. One great source of truth is literature. So they burned books, 20 million of them. Many great men in Germany who were spokesmen for truth were jailed or driven from their country. Teachers, writers, scientists. Education was discouraged. In five years, college attendance dropped 53%. It was forbidden to listen to a British radio program or read an American newspaper. In Nazi Germany, you had to get your information from Dr. Goebbels. He knew what was best for you. The church was one force in Germany still strong enough to proclaim the truth in public. This Catholic priest was arrested the following day on charges of immorality. The Protestant church also continued to try and fight for truth. The Nazis put this man in a concentration camp. There were others who spoke for truth and I am proud to say that educators were among them. And what, may I ask, is an Aryan? I don't know myself. But let us see what our present so-called authorities have to say about him. They say he is tall, slender, blue eye and blonde. There is no Aryan race. And more important, there is no master race. There are people who may find these ideas convenient, but science cannot support them. There is no scientific proof that there's any correlation between a man's racial characteristics and his native ability or character. In all racial groups, we find the same range of potentialities. We find idiots and geniuses. We find criminals and philanthropists. We must judge each man as an individual and not by the color of his skin, or his eyes, or by the length of his nose. Come in, gentlemen. It's comfortable. And remember that there is no master race. That is a scientific truth. Anyone who tells you otherwise 
is lying. And so for all practical purposes, truth had been abolished in Germany. A lot of my German friends wondered what had hit them. How did it happen? Where did it start? It started right here. And this was where it could have been stopped. If those people had stood together, if they had protected each other, they could have resisted the Nazi threat. Together they would have been strong. But once they allowed themselves to be split apart, they were helpless. When that first minority lost out, everybody lost out. They made the mistake of gambling with other people's freedom. Now let's see how those bets paid off. Carl the farmer was gambling on a better life for himself. What he got was extra hours of back-breaking work, as much as a hundred hours a week. He was forced to stay on his land and produce what he was told to produce, because now Hitler was preparing for war. For Heinrich, who owned the hardware store, the bet didn't pay off either. 104,000 small businesses were closed in two years. And for Hans, conditions hadn't improved any. He had a job now in the munitions factory, but he worked long hours for little pay. The working conditions grew increasingly bad. And even though he didn't like the job, he wasn't permitted to leave it. And when Hitler decided the time was right, Germany went to war. Not by declaring war, but by a carefully prepared sneak attack. Once again, Hitler needed Hans to do his dirty work. Hans was an expert at brutality by this time. And Hitler had decided to use Hans and his brutality against other peoples. The Czechs, the Poles, the French, the Russians. But in the crucial test of war, Hitler's race theories didn't pay off. His pure-blooded supermen were defeated by the mongrel armies he despised. By the British of El Alamein. By the Russians at Stalingrad. Then on D-Day by American soldiers of every color and religion who smashed across the Normandy beaches and drove on through to the heart of Germany. For the misguided Germans who had swallowed the Nazi bait, the Nazi game did not pay off. The continent of Europe was strewn with millions of German bodies, pure Aryan bodies. Karl the farmer was left in the snow outside of Moscow. Heinrich stayed in Italy at Salerno. And Hans, who was going to rule the world, got only a little patch of Normandy that he could call his own. We must never let that happen to us or to our country. We must never let ourselves be divided by race or color or religion, because in this country we all belong to minority groups. I was born in Hungary, you are a Mason. These are minorities. And then you belong to other minority groups too. You are a farmer, you have blues. You go to the Methodist church. Your right to belong to these minorities is a precious thing. You have a right to be what you are and say what you think, because here we have personal freedom. We have liberty. And these are not just fancy words. This is a practical and priceless way of living. But we must work at it. We must guard everyone's liberty, or we can lose our own. If we allow any minority to lose its freedom by persecution or by prejudice, we are threatening our own freedom. And this is not simply an idea. This is good, hard common sense. You see, here in America is not a question whether we tolerate minorities. America is minorities. And that means you and me. So let's not be suckers. We must not allow the freedom or dignity of any man to be threatened by any act or word. Let's be selfish about it. Let's forget about we and they. Let's think about us.